and my slides here. So I'm going to be sort of, oh, I, I'll wait for me now, hopefully. Um, yeah, so hello, everyone. Hi. My name, hello. My name is uh, Jack Lennox. Um, I work for Automatic. I'm on the WordPress.com VIP team. And um, the REST API has been an interest of mine for quite a long time. Um, I've been like playing around with it in various different ways. And I've given a few talks about it. Um, obviously, now it's very exciting because, as uh, John was saying, it's about to go into core, which is amazing. I mean, it's, some of it has been in core, as I'll explain. But the, like, the real thing is about to start happening. So it's really exciting right now. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a habit of talking really quickly. So I'm going to really try and focus on not speaking really quickly, because it's really hard for people to understand me. But you are welcome to slow me down. Uh, just put your hand up and say slow down. Uh, especially once I get going, I get really excited. So, um, so obviously, John's given you a bit of information about the REST API and uh, some uses for it, how it can work. Um, I want this thing to go. Oh, this thing at the bottom is going to stay, I'm afraid. Um, oh, no, it's not. It's going to go. Uh, so yeah, the case for a WordPress REST API. So if you imagine this sort of, like, I mean, some of you may still not really have much of an idea of what it is, because as much as you can see examples of it being used, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to get your head around why this is such an exciting thing and why it's so important. Um, so we'll begin with what a REST API is. Uh, as John, John had a slide, um, which he didn't linger on. So it stands for Representational State Transfer Application Programming Interface. So I guess that makes it really clear to everyone what it's for. We can pretty much finish there. Um, obviously, it doesn't. Um, there's a whole load of philosophy and theory that goes behind REST and RESTful systems. I'm not going to go into it too much, because I think you don't really need to know. Um, there's a great, like, if you go on the Wikipedia page and just look up what a REST API is, it will tell you a lot about uh, what it's for. But the main point is that it it allows data to be available in a human-readable form without the writing of any code. Like that's one of the most kind of fundamental ideas, is that it allows people to access the data from a website, uh, or from any system, actually. It's not necessarily a website. Uh, but it allows you to just get data by going to a certain address. That's kind of the key idea. Um, I won't try and explain all this. There's like a whole computer science degree in this. But if you are interested, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at and where it's come from and everything. You also, there are other APIs that you may have heard of. Like one of the most famous ones before REST, or the one of the most used, was SOAP. And again, if you Google like SOAP APIs, that's what a lot of stuff prior to REST APIs was built on. And lots of stuff today is still built with a SOAP API. I can't actually even remember what SOAP stands for. But yeah, there's, there's like, there are other ones, but the REST API is the kind of the one that's really hot right now. And it's the one that everyone thinks is the best going forward and the easiest to understand. So as I was saying, like making the data sort of human readable and human interactable with, uh, REST APIs are centered around verbs. So we have these ideas of like get, post, update, put, delete, and more. And there are others, but these are the, these are the main ones. And if you're interested, these are the ones that you're probably going to want to know about. Um, they're ho hopefully quite self-explanatory. So like get is going to be how you're going to get data from your website. Post is how you post stuff to it. Um, so posting, there are lots of different ways. I mean, posting could be updating. It could be putting. Um, but you can also be more granular in, the, in this. You can, you can specifically just update, put. And obviously, deleting is deleting stuff from your data set. So REST APIs will usually respond in JSON or XML. They, I think, according to the actual strict specifications, they don't have to, but that's the most common convention. Um, XML was more common uh, a few years ago. Uh, so hopefully, you all know what the, it's extensible markup language, and it's what HTML is. So if you've, ever, if you've ever written in HTML, HTML is a type of XML. And XML is just a syntax that uses those angle brackets in like you start an element, you close an element by like slashing. And you know, hopefully, you've all seen it. RSS is another sort of big uh, protocol that uses XML. For a long time, it was the kind of just the de facto way that everyone did things. And obviously, because it's the way that HTML is written, everyone really liked it. But the thing that's gradually got more popular and uh, more people understand is, is JSON, um, which is a bit less verbose because it doesn't involve you having to like open and close in, in the same way, like every single bit of data. So in theory, you can represent the same amount of data in JSON as you can in XML, but it will take up less space. So that's nice because it will be faster to load. Those, you know, it'll, it'll sort of just a bit quicker. It could obviously still be lighter weight. I gave a talk uh, in uh, WordCamp Prague last year, and uh, a guy in the, in the audience asked me a question. He was like, yeah, but there's still so much extra like brackets and stuff in JSON. And I mean, he kind of has a point. But the thing is that JSON, there are libraries for it in all of the mobile operating systems and everything. So 
Yes, in theory, you could have an even more lightweight syntax, like CSV or something, which is even better. But there is kind of this balance between making something human readable and making something uh, that is fast. And obviously, JSON isn't necessarily the fastest we could possibly have, but humans can look at it. And hopefully, when I show you some, you'll kind of be able to work out what's going on, which is kind of, yeah, good. Uh, there's a really good talk. Um, sorry, that's my phone. Shut that on silent. Uh, there's a really good talk by a guy called Rich Hickey, who's the uh, founder of Clojure, which is a, a language, and it's called Simple Made Easy. And he talks a lot about how it's not just about having, like, when you're picking something that you're going to use for a project, you want to also focus on how straightforward it is to use the software, not just how powerful it is, or you know that kind of thing. So JSON definitely at the moment seems to be the best balance between like human readable and it loads quickly. So why does WordPress need one? I mean, if you've built themes or plugins, you're probably quite used to using something like WP Query or the template tags to get things like titles and the content and the date out of your WordPress posts. Um, so you might be thinking, I don't understand. Like, what's, what's the point of, of being able to do another way of doing it? Like, we, do, we need code to use WordPress, so why does this make any difference to us? Well, I'm going to use an example. This is quite a strange example, but it's the first time I ever came across uh, a REST API for WordPress. Because although there's a plugin um, that we've been using, which is going to become part of WordPress with the next release, um, the actual history of REST APIs in WordPress goes back uh, quite a lot further than that. Um, does anyone know where this is, just out of interest? Has anyone been here? It is, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, so I like this example, because it was quite an elegant one that I came across. So the, yeah, it's also known as the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York. In 2009, so like, what now, seven years ago, um, I forget which year it is, um, uh, they had a project. Their developers wanted to use WordPress as the CMS, but they wanted to use Ruby to build the front end, because that was the skill set of the development team that they had. Um, so they were thinking, like, how can we mix these two things together? I have to say, on the next one, like, I don't know why, but they did. But um, it's a bit crazy. I don't know why. I, I mean, I'm imagining, I think probably the most compelling reason why they would have been doing this is that their staff and their journalists and their people that are used to maintaining systems probably understood WordPress, and there is no real equivalent of WordPress in the Ruby sphere. So if you want to have like, something that all your staff just know, and they might already use it for their own blogs and everything, you're going to use WordPress. But obviously, their staff use their Ruby developers. So if you try and imagine how you would get around this, does, does anyone here know Ruby? Has anyone used Ruby at all? So Michael, yeah, cool. Um, I mean, if, if it's not clear to people, like, it's going to be quite hard to interact with these two things, because there's no bridge. There's no way of building a theme in Ruby that would interact. You'd, you'd have to maybe try to connect to the MySQL database directly through Ruby, and then you're sort of losing all of the power of WordPress, because you're going to have to write like basically all of WordPress again, but connecting it via Ruby. So it's quite a complicated thing. Um, and their team thought, well, maybe what we should do is build a REST API, because we've got like one guy knows PHP, so he can do all the things that we're going to want to do in one go uh, in PHP, and then we can interact with it using Ruby. So they built this plugin, which actually, yeah, has been in the um, plugin directory since uh, 2009. Um, and this is the first one that I actually ever used. Um, I will tweet out my slides, so don't worry about the URLs and stuff. Uh, but yeah, this is a totally different plugin to the, to the REST API that is coming into WordPress now. Uh, but it's really good. It was, it was really well featured, um, sorry, re really fully featured. Um, you could do all sorts of things with it. You could, the things that John's been talking about, getting data out, putting data in. You could have built something like Nomad Base, pro probably, with this. Um, you could even extend it. You could add your own things to it. Um, so yeah, this is nothing new. Like this idea of a REST API in WordPress, people have been trying to do this without WordPress actually supporting it for at least seven years. And I think there's actually other projects as well that go back even, even further than this one. I think there's a SOAP API plugin for WordPress. So yeah, people have wanted to do other things. So building something in Ruby is a really good reason why you might want a REST API. Because unless you're doing something in PHP, you're kind of stuck. You can't really do much else. And partly as a result of this, uh, WordPress.com actually released their own REST API uh, in 2012, before I even uh, worked there. I started working at WordPress in, at uh, Automatic in 2013. Uh, I was going to say WordPress.com, I'm not, not WordPress. Um, so yeah, the WordPress.com REST API uh, was put together mainly because at that point, uh, Automatic became very involved in working on the mobile applications. And this is another example where PHP kind of has its limitations. Because if you want to get data out of a WordPress website and show it on a mobile application, it's pretty complicated. 
you could theoretically write a bunch of like admin Ajaxy things that can get the data out and send it back and have a whole bunch of like little URLs that do that sort of thing. Um, and actually, some people have even built REST APIs kind of like that, where it's doing a little bit like it's just in a theme. There'll be a bunch of like admin Ajax stuff that goes on inside it. Um, but yeah, it's basically a little bit tricky. So uh, this problem was identified at Automatic. So they started work on the WordPress.com REST API. Um, I don't think it was immediately available to all sites, but for a long time now, for at least three years, it's been available to self-hosted sites via Jetpack, um, which is really good because it's now being used throughout uh, all sorts of apps. As um, John was saying, like if you download the WordPress.com apps, you can access self-hosted websites because uh, it's, it's been using a combination of the WordPress.com REST API and the XML RPC API, which I will briefly mention. Um, and now it's actually using the REST API too. So at the moment, it's a bit complicated because it's using all sorts of things at the same time. But we're gradually converging and shifting everything. Like anything new that's getting added to anything is going towards the new REST API that's coming into core very shortly. The main drawback to the WordPress.com REST API, if you're a developer, is that you can't change it. You can't do anything with it. Um, when you activate it through the Jetpack plugin, basically what WordPress.com will do is serve data from your site through its own WordPress.com URL. So we've got this public API.wordpress.com, and you'll go to that address, and then you go to like sites, and then you type in the name of your website, and you'll get your data from your website. But fundamentally, you have no control. The REST API is not in Jetpack. It's happening on our servers. Uh, so unless, like me, you work automatic, you can't change it. And uh, even I can't really change it, because obviously I'll cause loads of problems if I start just making loads of changes that no one's asked for. Um, so that's the limitation. But yeah, this is, there's kind of a long history, which is the point I'm trying to get across uh, at this point. So this is the WordPress.com REST API. There's loads of documentation. Um, again, I'll tweet the links so you don't need to try and remember the URL, and you can barely see it. So yeah. So to summarize, the, the REST API use cases that we have are anything that's not PHP. Uh, so that, yeah, there is Ruby. There's also plenty of other systems. You could be working on a desktop, desktop application. As John said, you might be working in Java. You could be working in pretty much anything. Um, yeah, literally, you could be working in anything. And you won't be able, it will be very difficult for you to work with WordPress. Um, so then we've got, obviously, mobile devices, which is the most obvious thing that's happening right now, because we're all using, we probably all have a, a smartphone. Um, there are apps, obviously, that are helping us. But if we wanted to build something on a smartphone ourselves that works with WordPress, it's a bit difficult. Obviously, you can use some of these other plugins that I've just said, but WordPress out of the box isn't going to work for you. So, um, but more recently, like the thing that's gone really nuts, which has probably driven this REST API development more than anything else, is this little thing you might have heard of called JavaScript. Um, there's just endless things happening in the JavaScript world, um, all these new frameworks and libraries, and it's all going completely nuts at the moment. This is just a small handful. This isn't, this isn't no, nowhere near yeah. everything that's happening right now. Yeah, and there's, <laughs> I haven't even mentioned, React, React isn't even on there. This is just one I found from the uh, JavaScript Foundation, which is a new group that are trying to bring together all of these different uh, libraries and frameworks and make them interoperably good. Um, so yeah, the JavaScript world is going nuts. And one of the problems with WordPress in this whole equation is that if WordPress doesn't move forward to kind of meet where developers are wanting to go, because lots of developers like making stuff in JavaScript, because you can make stuff that loads quicker, and you can make nicer interactions between pages and all this kind of thing. Um, I've got some good examples of that if you haven't seen websites that do this. Um, yeah, if you're not going where the developers are going, then like WordPress could start to fall away. And you know, big competitors to WordPress, like Drupal, it's not big in terms of market share, because WordPress is still miles ahead. But Drupal is, is also has a REST API with Drupal 8. So competitors are moving in this direction because they want to be able to work with JavaScript. And there are, I mean, there are libraries like Backbone that some of you may have heard of. Backbone is used in WordPress core for things like the customizer. But Backbone, if you do like a tutorial about it on codeschool.com, there's a really good Backbone uh, lesson that takes you all the way through setting up an app in Backbone. And uh, it's entirely designed for working with a REST API that uses JSON. So, yeah, you've got this kind of community thing where people want to use REST APIs, and they want to use REST APIs that use JSON. Ember as well, actually, is the same kind of thing. And so WordPress at the moment doesn't cater for those at all. But very soon it will do. Oh, I've lost one of my things. Oh, OK. Anyway, Internet of Things. Uh, there is also a fridge. I don't know why it's gone. Uh, so there's the obvious things. There's mobile devices. There's watches. And then there's God knows what else is going to happen in the next 10 years with fridges and cars and all sorts of other applications and appliances that might want to use uh, WordPress. 
I'm not quite sure how a fridge would use WordPress, although actually maybe it could like have a list of all that you could have products and things that are in your fridge and then it yeah. could it could link up with Amazon to Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. So there could be like fridge press. Uh, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so yeah, there's I mean that this is like we've got the tip of the iceberg right now with like watches and phones, but there's obviously glasses. There's, there's loads and loads of things that are possibly going to be happening in the next few years. So it's good for WordPress to be sort of future-proof with these things. So I've talked a lot about these different REST APIs, but what is the WordPress.com? Uh, sorry, WordPress REST API. Um, I've italicized the because obviously we're, we're talking about a specific WordPress REST API. Um, so for that, you have this man to thank. This is a guy called uh, Ryan McHugh. Uh, Ryan is from Brisbane in Australia, and uh, he's like a WordPress wonder kid. Hey, I think he started con contributing to Core when he was about 11. He's really, really, really clever. And uh, in 2013, as, start as part of a Google Summer of Code project, so Google Summer of Code, it's this big community thing where um, people can like, register projects they're going to work on, they get a bit of support and a bit of like, help, and they, they do it every year. And so Ryan kicked one off in 2013 to build a REST API for WordPress. And I think in his original proposal, he thought it would get merged into Core in like six months or something. <laughs> well, uh, something crazy. And, uh, and like, so three years later, it's almost actually going in. And, uh, and Ryan now looks like a really old man. This is not... <laughs> Three years is still actually really quick, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's taken him a, a lot of effort. He also managed to get some help from some other folks. So the, the three main maintainers and sort of the developers of the REST API are Ryan, Joe, uh, Joe Hoyle from Human Made, which is a big WordPress agency in the UK. Yeah, and yeah, well, Ryan wasn't Human Made when he started building it, but now he is. <laughs> so Ryan got a job through that. And then there's uh, Daniel Backhuber who some of you may have heard of. He's an American guy, and he's the key maintainer of WPCLI, if anyone's used WPCLI. Uh, so you've got, like, there's some good brains behind it, and I think that's partly what's helped push it along. Um, and obviously, like, Matt Mullenweg, who's the founder of WordPress, he's been very keen on the idea since it first started. Um, but yeah, he's also been very specific about how he wants it to work, which is part of how it's taken a while to come in. But I mean, Matt's like that with everything that goes in WordPress, because WordPress powers a quarter of the internet. So if you're going to put something in, you want to make sure that it, it works properly. So. Ryan started a plugin, so it's a feature plugin. If people aren't familiar with the way that WordPress gets built, one of the things that was settled on about three years ago, actually, as a way of building most of the new features that go in, is to start them as a plugin. So someone will start building a plugin, which is what they want to see in WordPress, um, and then over time, people can activate the plugin and see if they like it, see if it works how, they, how the person says it does. They can look at the code, and then eventually, that plugin might get merged into WordPress itself, so it becomes part of core. So the REST API has been a feature plugin. So since 2013, you've been able to install it as a plugin and use it. Um, and it's all developed under this uh, URL. Again, I'll, I'll, don't worry about the, the slides. Um, and yeah, you can see the whole history of the whole thing here. Um, it's actually now into its version 2. So version 2 is what's going to be going into WordPress core. Actually, I think version 1 probably will be there as well. But the, the version 1 endpoints were, it was decided about over a year ago now, I think, that they, weren't, they just weren't quite as versatile as everyone would have liked. So a few architectural changes were made, and, uh, and version 2 started, and that's what's kind of... So you might see version 2 in different places, but it's effectively version 1 for the community. So, yeah, don't worry about version 1. So uh, a kind of weird aspect of this whole thing is that the infrastructure of the WordPress REST API was actually merged in 4.4 on the 8th of December 20, 2015, um, so the infrastructure is all of the code that fundamentally powers what the REST API does. Um, so that's actually been in there uh, so, yeah, since 4.4. And the way that the plugin has worked, if you wanted to use it, um, the plugin kind of knows uh, like if, there is, if, it's, if, it's, if it's been added to a version of WordPress that already has the infrastructure, it just knows which bits to activate and which bits not to. So like, if going away tonight you want to start playing with the REST API now, you can, like with, with how it's going to be on the 6th of December, pretty much, because you can still just activate the plugin on, like, on WordPress, WordPress 4.6, and it will just work perfectly fine. <laughs> Obviously, from the 6th of December, it's going to be in there anyway. And at that point, I think the plugin will either automatically disable itself, or it won't clash. Like, there's no conflict. So don't worry about having the plugin activated. It won't cause you any problems. Um, but yeah, so I, I was getting on to, there's no, there were no endpoints in WordPress 4.4. So this meant there was actually no public way of accessing anything the REST API did. It was just theoretically there. Uh, and I'll explain what endpoints are in a sec. But the endpoints are coming in 4.7. So it's all happening. It's all really exciting. Um, so yeah, how does the REST API 
actually work, and what the heck is an endpoint, which we keep saying. So, yeah, REST APIs, as I was saying right at the start, they effectively interpret a URL and return a response, and they work out from the URL what the person who's typed that in is trying to get. Um, in some ways, it's not massively different to RSS. And actually, so if anyone's used the RSS feeds, which have been part of WordPress since like 1.9 or something, uh, you'll know that if you go to any WordPress URL, and after the WordPress, uh, sorry, after the URL you put sort of .com or .com.sg or whatever, slash feed, you'll get RSS. And you can then add all sorts of queries to the end of that slash feed, and you can get post types, and you can get, like, you can paginate, all sorts of things like that. Um, and I've still got my Athens thing. These slides are from my WordCamp Athens talk, so I'm afraid that's why it says WC Athens. Ignore that. Um, but yeah, so you can do something very similar with the REST API. If you're just going to get things out, you could say, if, if you have the REST API activated on your website, you go to yourwebsite.com slash wpjson slash wp slash v2 slash posts. And to just break that down, the wpjson, that is kind of the root part of the REST API. So it's a bit like wp-admin, but it's wpjson. Um, so yeah, you type it in at the same point. Um, one of the ideas that was added to version 2 of the REST API was this very concept of versioning the endpoints. So before, on version 1, you would just go wpjson slash posts, and you would get your posts. Now the problem here is that if it was decided that in WordPress 5.1 they were going to change the way the REST API worked, anyone who'd built anything that used the REST API was going to break. Because if they're like changed, let's say they changed the like post title to the post title or something, anyone who's using it, they would like the post title would disappear because they're getting the wrong thing from the REST API. So this concept of versioning was introduced and of namespacing. So WP is the namespace. Uh, that means it's like a WordPress endpoint. Because uh, in theory, if you're building a big plugin, for example, WooCommerce has support for the REST API, and their endpoints are WC. Um, and then slash, the version number. So if you were doing, doing your own endpoints, you, you would probably start with version 1. You'd have to start with version 2. Um, but obviously for WordPress, there's version 2, and then there's posts. So this is one of the new things. So post is the most important part here, and that's saying we want to get posts. So what we would get back from the REST API if we typed this in, and we had the REST API activated, would be something a little bit like this. Um, I've actually removed some of the things to just make it slightly easier to read, because you get lots of stuff back. Um, but hopefully, some of this will look quite familiar. So we have things like the post ID at the top. This is post ID 1. It's the Hello World post that comes with every single uh, installation of WordPress. You have things you're probably used to seeing, like the date and the modified date, uh, the slug, which is also known as the post name in, in WordPress. So some of the terminology of the naming of these fields is actually to do with the REST theory. So in REST, you would call, for example, the link to a post. You would just call it link. So whereas most people here, if you've worked a lot with themes and stuff, you're probably quite used to the permalink, like the underscore permalink, open bracket, close bracket, semicolon. Um, in the REST API, you just get link. And that's, that's the same thing. Uh, and similarly, like title is just like title. It's not post title or post underscore title. Content, it's not the content. It's just content. Um, but this is how things come back. Now, you can just type this in in a normal browser, and you'll get this. You actually will get this without any of the spaces or anything in the, in the carriage returns. So it's going to look like just one big horrible string, and it will look quite hard to read. There are a whole bunch of browser extensions that will add these like, line breaks to make it easier to understand what it's saying. But yeah, you will effectively get this back um, just in black, and it'll be quite hard to read. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is like making it slightly nicer, and obviously using colors and stuff to make it easier to understand what's going on. But hopefully, some of this will look quite familiar. So we have things like title. Um, you'll notice as well that it's like nesting this other object, which has rendered inside it, um, for something like title. And the reason for that is simply that down the line, there might be other types of title that you could get. And in fact, it's even more relevant with something like content. So for example, content, it will render it with the, uh, the P tags that you get in, in HTML. So WordPress does this thing called auto P, where every time you've pressed enter, it's going to add paragraph tags in HTML so that you get like paragraphs rather than just a big long string of text, because HTML doesn't know what a carriage return is. It's not going to register that. Um, now, that's all well and good if you're building something that's web-based. But if you fundamentally aren't using something that actually does anything with HTML, this rendered thing is, could be quite useless to you. Uh, you might say, for example, want to use Markdown, and you might want to get the Markdown version of the content out of the REST API. So at the moment, it does just return the rendered content. But you can actually add to this. And so you could add, like, Markdown could be another field under content. Uh, or you could just have plain, like a, a totally plain version that doesn't do any of the automatic formatting that WordPress does. Um, so that's what that's for. 
That's kind of a full explanation of how the JSON works. But yeah, I've taken a few out, so there are also other things you'll get back. There are things relating to like the category, the post type, the taxonomy, uh, all sorts of other like meta uh, data that's related to a post. But these are like key things that you've hopefully all used and seen over the years. And here are some other examples. So in fact, I should also say, like, I'm, I'm only returning one post here. So if I only have one post in my website, going to the posts endpoint would give me the one post I have. If you have lots of posts in your website, it will do whatever the default loop is for your WordPress site. So, so like the default loop out of the box is going to be the 10 most recent posts. So that's what, in, what would actually happen here is you can see these square brackets at the top and bottom. In JavaScript, that's an array, and it's, I think, the same in PHP. So you would have an array of the posts. So there'd be a comma at the end, and then it would carry on to like next post, next post, next post, and you would get 10. Uh, if that's your default, if you change it to 5 in your settings, you would get 5, uh, and so on. So there's more endpoints, and there's way more than this. But just to give you examples of other things you can get, if you want to get uh, one post and you want to get that post by its ID, let's say you know the post ID, that top one will take you to one post, so you won't get a whole bunch. If you want the pages, you get the same idea. You go to pages. And if, uh, similarly, if you want a page by a specific ID, you put the ID at the end. And again, these concepts are to do with the way that rest, RESTful systems work. Um, and that, so although they might seem a bit alien, that's just how it works. Uh, if you want to get all your users, you can do that, and you want to get all your categories. And hopefully you're starting to see the sort of versatility of this. Like this means that you could do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, and if you are working with, say, a mobile developer or an iOS developer, they're just going to totally get this. Like you do, if, you're, if you're not planning to build anything yourself, but you want to work with developers who are using other systems, you can just say, yeah, we've got a REST API. And they'll be like, oh, brilliant. I understand all of this. They'll know exactly. Because it's the same as like the GitHub REST API. Reddit has a built-in REST API, which is very similar to this. You can actually go to any Reddit URL and type .json at the end, and you'll get the, the JSON REST API response um, for that page, which is pretty cool. So yeah, people get this, um, even though it's quite new to a lot of WordPress people. But obviously, there's more things you can do. Uh, everything I've shown you so far, well, most of it anyway, you could theoretically do with, um, with RSS, because actually getting stuff out of your website is already theoretically available with RSS. Um, and by default, if you go to these URLs, as I've just been showing you in a browser, a browser will do a GET request by default. So that's what you're seeing. That's what that JSON was that came back. But there are other types of requests that we could do. We could do posts and puts and updates and deletes, as I've been saying. Um, so you, this is kind of how you would process a form. You can post things to the REST API. Now, you might be wondering, this is a bit dangerous. Does this not mean that people can like, just add posts to my website, update, delete things? No. <laughs> Because uh, there are sort of two layers to the REST API. There's the things that are publicly available by default, and then there is authentication. So in order to do anything that you would need access to your dashboard to do, you need authentication. So one of the controversies when the REST API was first coming into being is that people were really worried about the fact that this would actually expose all sorts of private information that they might have in their WordPress website, and it could be really dangerous. Um, some people, one guy had an example of a website he had where he was storing customer transactions as a custom post type, um, which was storing address details, I think maybe even credit card details. And this was already completely stupid because, <laughs> no offense to this man, but you could already get that with the REST API, uh, with the um, RSS. You could already actually get a custom post type out. So the REST API exposes nothing publicly that's not already public from your WordPress website. Um, so if you do store customer details as a custom post type that don't require authentication, uh, stop doing that. That's, that's a really, really bad idea. Um, because in theory, yes, the REST API would make those available. Except that there is one thing. When you're adding a custom post type, something that's now been done by default is that it actually won't show in the REST API. Uh, there's a thing called show in REST, and you have to set that to true when you're creating a custom post type in order for it to be visible through the REST API. But for everything else, if you're going to obviously anyone adding, anyone deleting, anything like that, that's going to want authentication. So here we have a whole bunch of options. And this is one of the things that's actually held the project up a bit because it's quite complicated. Um, so the most simple type of authentication is what's known as basic authentication. And basic authentication is really easy. It's great. So if you're going to do a post request, you can just, uh, in the way that you would say post a form, you can add like a username field, which is the person's username, and you can add a password field, which is the person's password. So you could collect that from a form, you can post it to the REST API. The really, really bad news, and so if anyone's used like curl, you can do the same thing, you can like, do that. The really bad news is that's obviously going to be passed over the wire in plain text. 
So if you were sitting in a cafe watching someone use an app that you had built that did basic authentication without HTTPS, they would see everyone's usernames and passwords being like in plain text just going across the wire, and they could pick those out and obviously log in, do all sorts of damage. Um, so basic authentication is really good for developing and testing. If you want to just check if something actually works, you can use it. Uh, at the end of this talk, I've got a link to the um, documentation for the REST API, and that they've got some great ex ex tutorials. Basically, all of these authentication systems have plugins which make them accessible. So basic authentication won't work by default. You have to actually uh, activate the plugin, and then it will work. Um, over HTTPS, basic authentication isn't so bad, because obviously it's, it's more secure. It, it's harder to do this kind of listening thing. But posting a password in plain text is just generally, whether it's over HTTPS or not, it's just still not very good practice. So yes, in theory, it's safer. But again, probably don't do that. Um, cookie authentication is arguably the easiest, because uh, there's a lot more help here. But, well, I mean, basic authentication is very easy, but cookie authentication is also quite easy. Um, and it's great for themes and plugins. Cookie authentication is basically going to do what WP Admin already does. So when you log into a WordPress website, it creates a couple of cookies, which for anyone who's not familiar, is these little, little kind of bits of data that are stored in your browser's memory. And instead of like constantly checking the username and password and everything, it just checks this cookie is there. And it uses that cookie to keep you signed in. And it has an expiry and that kind of thing. It's why it can be quite dangerous if you're on a public internet connection uh, and, you, and you're logging into a WordPress website with HTTPS. Someone theoretically could get your cookie, and then they can spoof being logged in as you. And it's, it caused a lot of problems in the early days with Facebook and stuff, where people would sit in cafes. And I imagine, especially someone like Singapore, where there's lots of people on laptops in cafes. If the internet connection to a cafe doesn't require a password, this is like mega easy. You can just sit and listen and see. And obviously, in airports and stuff, you still see a lot of this. So um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. That's why you should use HTTPS. Like a little side note, use HTTPS. It's available now for free. Um, so yeah, definitely do that. Cookie authentication uh, is going to use that same authentication that you're using for WP Admin. So all your user is going to have to do is log in the way they normally would. And once they're logged in, they can be authenticated through the REST API. So you can use the same login system that you already have. Uh, let's say you have like a dashboard for managing uh, HR things, like uh, John was talking about. You've got like an HRM. You could build a theme that's all built in like React and all sorts of lovely JavaScript things. And yeah, you just send the user to log in like they normally would, and then you can start doing all the admin-y kind of things that you might want to do. And then we get on to the OAuth, which is like, ah. Uh, um, so <laughs> OAuth 1.0 is the most versatile, because the biggest problem with OAuth 2 is it requires HTTPS. Now, as I just said, isn't HTTPS a really good idea? Shouldn't we all use it? Yes, we should. But this REST API is being added to WordPress, which powers 26% of the internet. And the vast majority of WordPress, web WordPress websites at the moment still don't use HTTPS. So we need something that is usable by people. Uh, and that's where OAuth 1 comes in. So the way that OAuth works, I should have like a little animation actually that shows this, but anyone who's logged in using their Facebook account or their Twitter account or their Google account to any other, other service, you know, where you can like log in with Facebook or sign up with Facebook, that's OAuth. So when you get this like, this website wants to use your credentials to be activated on this website, are you okay with that? And you click approve or you click deny, that's the OAuth system going on there. And what basically happens behind the scenes is that some tokens are exchanged. You get like a private token, a little bit like the cookie thing, but it's independent of, of cookies. You have a private token, and then you can use that token to authenticate yourself in future. So OAuth 1 is, is pretty good because it, yeah, it kind of deals with all of this. And it, has, it gets around the HTTPS thing by being a little bit more complicated, which is why it's not the easiest thing to use. But it's theoretically the most versatile. And actually, the core team behind the REST API have put most of their resources into that, because that's the thing that everyone can use. Uh, and OAuth 1 is even better, obviously, over HTTPS. But if you are using HTTPS, you can use OAuth 2. Um, yeah, OAuth 2 has had a lot less of focus, because there's like, there's, if you just Google it, there's great things about how to get it set up and running. Uh, OAuth 2 is what the WordPress.com REST API uses, because WordPress.com, this is part of why WordPress.com doesn't serve its REST API stuff. I'm getting to, I've said REST API about 100 times in the last hour. But uh, yeah, it serves it through our URL, because we can then make it HTTPS, which kind of deals with all of these problems. This is why it all gets a little bit, little bit of a pain. Um, but yes, so OAuth 1 is, is, is the way that you're probably going to want to do things unless you're happy using HTTPS and stuff. So there's a whole bunch of documentation. I've got a link at the end. Um, the biggest problem with using OAuth 1 is that it creates these tokens and if someone does, like, I mean, what, you need to store those tokens somewhere. So you might store them as like a user meta 
variable or something for your users. Um, though it also then becomes complicated, how do you get them out? Because how do you authenticate yourself to get the user meta to get, it, get the token back out? Uh, which is a little bit of a pain. And then obviously also, if someone did hack into your system, they'd have all these, auth all these user tokens. And it's really hard to then, you have to build your own system to like invalidate a token. Like if, if there's a user who's gone rogue, someone's stolen their phone, like how do you stop that user being able to activate? It, it gets pretty complicated quite quickly. So something that the REST API team have been working on is what they're calling brokered authentication. So in this system, the WordPress REST API team are the broker. Uh, and they basically are storing all of this data and they, you authenticate with them and they authenticate with your website and then it's kind of this big two-way thing. So then when you want to authenticate, they'll send you the token and they, they deal with all of the security and they're HTTPS. So that's how this whole thing kind of becomes safer. If you go to apps.wpapi.org, you can set up any website that you want to use this with. It's totally free. Um, uh, and, and actually, the software they're using behind this is also open source. So you can actually, if you're running a big business and you don't trust them, which is, you know, reasonable, you shouldn't trust anyone, uh, you can actually run the same software yourself. So you could run like apps.yourwebsite.com and you could have this at your own broker, which you set up on HTTPS and then all of your other properties. Let's say you're a news network and you've got lots of subsites and everything. You only need HTTPS on the one website and then all your others can carry on working. I'm probably boring you to death now talking about authentication, but uh, yeah, it's a bit complicated, so it needs a bit of time. Um, I have got, there was a really good talk by a guy called Joe Hoyle, who we've already mentioned. Uh, he spoke at WordCamp Europe earlier this year, and I would recommend watching his talk where he talks about this in more detail, and he built this so he understands it more than I do. Um, yeah, it's a really good talk, and it's, it's free on WordPress.tv. Modifying and adding endpoints. Um, so I have this slide, but I actually don't have any example code. There's some really good documentation on the API website. I'm going to skip this now, but if we have, where are we up to? I'm, uh, I'm actually running out of time. So uh, we could do this maybe in the question and answer section if people want me to look at it, uh, and I can show you it. But there's, yeah, the documentation is really good. They have like copy and paste examples that you can just modify. The key point of this is that you can modify and add endpoints, as you might guess from what my slide says. Um, so here's a good example of why you might want to modify an endpoint. When I showed you what came, comes back from the REST API when you're looking at a single post, uh, if you were building, say, a theme, there are certain things that you might use on a per post basis that you're not getting back from the REST API. So I've built some themes that use the REST API in JavaScript. And for example, post class is something that you normally want because you use the post class for styling, for individual posts, um, and you're probably going to want that to show up somewhere. So you could modify the post endpoint. I've done this, and I I'll share it somewhere on like a GitHub gist or something. Um, and you can see how it's done. You basically can just add post class in to the REST API at the relevant point. It's really straightforward because you can just pass post class an ID. So you're just basically going to extend the API and say, like, take the post ID, add post class to the response that comes back, and you'll get the post class. Adding endpoints gets into a whole new world. You can actually set up, as I was saying, WooCommerce has like its whole own namespace and everything. So they've got like a whole host of new products and so as products as endpoints and all the other things that they use as endpoints. Um, but you can just add like one. So say you just want to add an, an endpoint for a custom post type uh, where you're going to do something a bit different to what normally happens. You can also just do that. Uh, there's, yeah, there's great documentation. Like there's register rest field and register uh, rest endpoint, I think. And they're just like hooks that like in, a, in the same way that other WordPressy things work. Uh, yeah, so we could look at that maybe in the question time. I'm getting quicker, so I'm going to slow down again. Whew. Right, we're almost done. Bear with me. So, uses for the WordPress REST API. So we've obviously talked around a lot of the things that people might want to use the REST API for, and there are now some very good examples emerging of, of how it can be used. So one of the most popular is this sense of what uh, John talked about, a custom interface, like a custom admin interface to WordPress. If anyone has ever tried to hack WP admin, you'll know it's hellish. And uh, most people that try to do this, they actually normally want to remove more than half of what WP admin is doing anyway, because people find WP admin very confusing. For, for people who've never used WordPress before, they're like, whoa, you're kind of giving them, especially if the user is an admin, they have all this stuff they don't necessarily need to know about. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to hack WP admin, it's a nightmare because it's like it's not really designed to be hacked. You can add stuff to it and like you can make little changes, but to actually unhook all of WP admin, and then obviously you're losing the access for you have to kind of unhook it on a per user basis because you probably still want one user who has full access. Anyway, with the REST API, you can just start from scratch. So rather than starting with WP admin deleting everything, you can start from scratch and only add the things that you actually want. 
Um, so we've done this on WordPress.com. If anyone here has a website on WordPress.com, you'll notice that the dashboard that you now see is not WP Admin, and that's this project called Calypso, which we've been working on. Um, Calypso is built with React and lots of other JavaScript libraries, and uh, it allows us to tailor the experience to people on WordPress.com. Um, so it's really nice. Anyone can see it by just signing up on, for a website on WordPress.com. Another really nice example, which is kind of totally different to that, is uh, Happy Tables, and they, that Happy Tables is a product, a project, uh, a project, product. I say project, project, no project, a product. I've been on a long flight. Uh, so Happy Tables is a product for restaurants, and it gives them a custom admin interface to deal with a whole bunch of things that you would want to do while running a restaurant day to day. Happy Tables started. This is what I was going to try and say as a hacked WP admin, like they made their own version of WP admin. Um, and this is part of where their enthusiasm, where Human Made is, sorry, the company behind Happy Tables, that's, and, and you know, Ryan works on this, this is partly where the enthusiasm for the REST API came about. Um, but the new Happy Tables, so it's gone through like four or five versions now. The latest one is like an all singing, all dancing, amazing JavaScript interface that like it's, it can be set up on iPads in the restaurant and the, user, the, the uh, servers and waiters can come up and they can say, yeah, we've dealt with that table. We've done like, it does a whole bunch of like di different storage of details, but it's effectively a custom WP admin interface. And there's a whole bunch of custom post types and stuff running beneath the scenes that make all of that work. Unfortunately, unless you work at a restaurant where they have it, you can't fully see it, but if you go to happytables.com, you can get a sense of how it works. Um, I don't think it's open source, but yeah, it's interesting. Mobile applications, a really obvious one. Uh, so there's the WordPress mobile apps, which are, which are open source. They are as projects. They're mo mostly led by uh, Automatic and WordPress.com, but they are open source. Anyone is able to contribute to them. The problem is that obviously most WordPress people are not mobile developers. That's why they're WordPress people. So there's not a great like, overlap in the Venn diagram. But, uh, but yeah, so they are mostly led by Automatic, but you can see how they work. At the moment, the mobile apps are using a horrible like, mixture of the XML RPC API. And I will very quickly give a tiny sub, sub note to the XML RPC API. This is uh, another way of doing a lot of the same things that the REST API allows you to do. It's just way more complicated, and the protocol is a lot harder to understand. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, like in, in its essence, it's not that different, but it's, the main problem is the barrier to entry. And the, uh, mobile development platforms are not as ready for dealing with an XML RPC API as they are a REST API. Neither is any of the JavaScript libraries. So it could have been the REST API, but it just sadly hasn't really worked in the same way. So, but the people who built the WordPress apps did bash it and make it work, and uh, so it does work. The apps, yeah, they use a combination of the WordPress.com REST API, and as of about six months ago, anything new that was being added to the apps is now on the WordPress REST API. Um, a much more pure example of an app that uses the REST API is one that Joe Hoyle, again, made. Uh, he's a great guy. So if you go to github.com slash Joe Hoyle slash Vienna, he showed this off at WordCamp Europe, which was in Vienna. That's why it's called Vienna. It's a really nice React Native app that purely uses the REST API. It's only for iOS at the moment, but you can, if you've got an iPhone, you can download and install it. And it's, yeah, it's all REST API, uh, all like WordPress REST API. There's no .com and no XML RPC and all that kind of thing. So it's a really nice, pure example. Uh, it also uses the brokered authentication. So if you want to see how that works in a public example, you can see him using the brokered authentication in that app. Themes. Um, this is a whole another field which, which may interest or not interest some of you. Um, there are lots of potential, this is kind of my other thing, talk, which I, I give about my theme, Picard. Um, there are lots of potential user experience improvements that can come about uh, from using JavaScript to build a theme. Uh, and obviously, then you're going to want to use something like the REST API. Um, one of the biggest things, actually, which I think is going to be, uh, none, none of these themes use this, but something to think about is that there's a new browser technology called Service Worker. And Service Worker allows a website to carry on working when there's no internet connection. So basically, once a user has come to your website, you can download things using service workers to decide what things are going to be stored offline. Then when the user comes back to your website, it's loaded from the memory first, and then you can decide which things you're going to update. Um, the thing that's crazy about this is that, I mean, this is still really new, it's still very cutting edge, but I reckon in like five years' time, clients are going to say, like, why doesn't my website work offline? In the same way that now, clients expect responsive websites. But like I remember being at one of the first talks when Ethan Marcote, who came up with responsive web design, I think it was in 2011 at the Future Web Design in London, 
he was kind of talking about responsive, and everyone was like, ooh, this is really exciting. Uh, and no one had ever heard of it, and it was completely nuts. And this was like five years ago. And, look, and today, like, my dad knows what a responsive website is, and you know, he's a Luddite. And uh, hopefully he won't watch it, engineers.sg. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, he would be, uh, he knows what a responsive website is, and he will judge a website as not being very good if it's not responsive. If it doesn't work on his phone properly, he's like, oh, why is it not working? So it's only a matter of time before clients say, why doesn't my website work when there's no internet connection? So these are things like when um, John was talking about us needing to move on, like this is something where JavaScript could become more important than PHP and, and sort of already cu currently is. Um, that's one very good example of a user experience improvement. There's lots of smaller improvements like animations and you can preload things. So in Picard, for example, it loads the 10 most recent posts on the home page. But then when you click on one of those posts, it loads it from memory. So because it's already got it, because when it's gone through the list of posts, it knows what the content is. So even though you're only seeing the title and the date and stuff and the excerpt, maybe you click it and it just it's instant. So you're like removing a page load to zero rather than it being even a second or something. So really good and very good for mobile experiences if you're on a bad 3G connection. I know in Singapore, no one really knows what a bad 3G connection is. But if you leave Singapore, data connections get really bad, like in Greece, where I just was. Um, and you really, you really love it when a website doesn't have to refresh each page load just to get you some more content. Um, yeah, and like in, the, in London, when you go on the underground, you have no mobile connection. So this, these things are really exciting. But obviously, in Singapore, you have 4G like everywhere. So it's not a problem. Um, anyway, so there's my theme, uh, Picard, which is available through the automatic uh, user account. Picard is horribly out of date. It's using version one of the REST API. I can't really recommend that you look at it, but it's not actually bad as like a museum piece. So uh, it's because it's about 18 months old now, and I'm really bad at maintaining it. But it's not actually to, so bad to just look at to get a sense of how like React works and how you can build a theme. Much better maintained uh, versions of the same idea are by my colleague Kelly Duan at Automatic. So her username is Rael on GitHub. She's got Anadama React, which is like a recipe theme, and uh, Foxhound, which is a very text text heavy theme. Uh, both of them are easier to understand than mine. Uh, but then she does use some more complicated things like uh, Redux, if no one's ever seen Redux, whereas Picard is like really like just taped together with like Pritt stick and stuff. So it's, like, it's much easier to understand how it's doing things, whereas Kelly's is more advanced and cleverer. Um, plugins, as I've mentioned, we've got things like uh, GitHub. Uh, sorry, GitHub. That's not a plugin. Uh, WooCommerce. Um, so if you go to the WooCommerce plugin, you can see how they're doing their like crazy REST API stuff, where they have slash wc slash whatever. Uh, a much more simple example is Easy Digital Downloads (EDD). Some of you might know uh, by Pippin, who's a famous plugin developer in the WordPress world. Um, he's also just got some quite simple extensions on the REST API using the sort of modification uh, and adding thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, and there are loads of other plugins that could really benefit. So Automatic, I help work on a plugin called the Push Syndication plugin. And it's an absolute hell because it uses like CLI and all sorts of weird things. And like with the REST API, uh, it would work much better. Just to quickly, I didn't explain what it does. Uh, we have some big news networks where they have like a central. So CBS, for example, have a central news website on, on WordPress.com. And then they have a whole bunch of local versions of the same thing. And every now and again, they'll have a new story that they're going to put on CBS Central that they want to go to all of their local websites as well. So we have the syndication plugin, which in theory quite nicely allows them to just do that. They just say, yes, I want this post to go everywhere. And then it also connects up for updating and everything as well. And at the moment, the syndication plugin, which I've been working on recently, is just like the underworld. It's just not, not pleasant at all. Um, but it could use the REST API, and we're probably going to push it that way over time. And so there's loads of plugins you've probably used, and maybe plugins you've made, that would be better if they use the REST API instead of whatever they've used to try and do the same thing. And then the really exciting thing as well that's been going on in this sphere is like uh, enterprise, big, big websites, um, big companies. And as I was saying, there's this kind of offline thing that people are expecting. So Quartz, QZ.com, I've used this example before. It actually uses the WordPress.com REST API, but you get a sense of some of these much better user experience things that can be gained from using it. A much more recent, and another, another WordPress.com VIP client is Facebook. If you go to facebookbrand.com, it's really, really nice. It's, uh, it's all built in React. Um, it's really sweet, uh, and it's really nice on mobile. And you'll see there's like no page load times between clicking links and stuff. It's just really, really, really nice. And then if you want like the most extreme example I can think of today, uh, it's not WordPress, but it's kind of a sense of what I was just saying about this JavaScript world, go to the Google I.O. website. Um, I could have actually had links to these, but because I was in Athens and the internet was terrible, I didn't. But obviously, yeah, you can check all these out. Um, 
Google I.O. is just incredible. So their, their, their website for the event they had this year, 2016, it uses this service worker thing I was talking about. So as you go to it, it will have a little thing that pops up and says, yep, I'm now ready for, can I, I'll now work offline. You can turn the Wi-Fi off on your phone and it'll just carry on working. It's really nice, especially for things like conferences where you're going to have schedules and that kind of thing where you don't, all these people are just constantly hitting your server and hitting your Wi-Fi to check the schedule when the schedule's not changing. Like it might change once every, you know, it might change because of a last minute thing. But yeah, it's, it's really exciting for that really exciting for like hotels and stuff where people can already have the data about a hotel and they can arrive in a foreign country with no data roaming and they can still access the hotel website, get the details, get the directions. Loads of exciting things that can be done with this. It's a whole new world, uh, as Aladdin says. But anyway, um, very exciting times ahead. So here's some links and any questions. I've overran slightly. Sorry about that. Um, so v2.wpapi.org, that's the current place where the documentation for the REST API has been. I must admit, I didn't know about what John said until he, I think he told me the other day. But uh, so I'm guessing a lot of the stuff that's there is going to be shifting to the REST API handbook. But there's plenty of stuff there at the moment if you do want to find like information right now. Uh, and obviously, hopefully, the REST API handbook is going to become really good as well. Um, there's a whole load of talks about the REST API on WordPress TV. I haven't gone too deep on a lot of the different concepts because there's better talks, frankly, that you can already see. Um, so yeah, you just search REST API. I'd really recommend the one that Joe gave at WordCamp Europe from earlier this year. And if you are interested in learning JavaScript and it's quite new to you and all of this stuff is sounding a bit intimidating, there's a really good uh, WordPress course led by a guy called um, Zach. I've just completely forgotten his surname. I should know his surname. Anyway, Zach is the guy who was doing uh, WordPress courses on Treehouse. If anyone's used Treehouse, he was the, the WordPress chap. Uh, and now he's got his own little spin-off thing, so JavaScript for WP.com. He's got loads of uh, courses that in, in, like, in, look into all the different ways that the REST API can be used, different ways that JavaScript can be used. So although he's mainly talking about JavaScript, it's inherently about WordPress a lot. Um, but yeah, any questions? So I thought this was really good or really bad. <laughs> so the really... Uh, there is actually one thing I was going to add. Like, I've, I've got a question for myself. Oh, I don't like JavaScript. Like, I don't want to have to, you know, this, is, this sounds rubbish. There's actually good news. You don't actually necessarily have to use JavaScript. And one thing that I think is an interesting thing I would add to what John was saying is, like, does this mean that JavaScript will become more important than PHP? Not necessarily, because uh, there's a new technology coming to browsers that's going to be in probably in the next few years called WebAssembly. And yes, it's actually, believe it or not, assembly language for the web, which people think is great because like, the web's kind of gradually degrading into like we use you know, uh, make and things like that now instead of gulp. And it's kind of going back to the 70s. And so uh, the really exciting thing about WebAssembly is that it will actually mean that instead of having to use JavaScript, which is the only scripting language that's built into browsers, other languages could potentially be supported by browsers inherently. So something I've been getting really into lately is a language called Elm. If you go to elmlang.org, it's nothing like JavaScript at all. At the moment, it compiles into JavaScript. So to run it right now, it has to be compiled. But there's a good possibility, at, like down the line, it will work remotely. It will work itself on you know, browsers. It could work itself on fridges. So there's a whole load of languages. There's like PostScript and TypeScript. Um, all these other like scripts which are kind of different versions of JavaScript. At the moment what they all do is compile into JavaScript but uh, Elm is a functional language. It's like really nice to use. It's um, the compiler is all based around like helping developers have a nicer life. So like the, the guy who made it wants to make development fun again but that's his kind of his credo. So it's a really nice language to learn, really nice language to use. I'm currently building a WordPress theme in it which I'm going to share at some point. Um, but yeah, so there are like, you don't, if you really don't like JavaScript, which is totally reasonable, uh, there are op other options. And Elm kind of does all the things JavaScript doesn't do. It has like static type, uh, strict types. Um, it kind of forces you to think about things that you wouldn't normally worry about with JavaScript, so things that would just break normally. Uh, it deals with all of those. And the biggest bonus that I've found so far is you have zero runtime errors. You never have like undefined is not a function, if anyone's familiar with that. Yep. People know what I'm talking about. Uh, that never happens because it has a compiler, which, because it's so static and it's so strict about how it should work, 
uh, it will know exactly how your code should look. So the compiler will stop you compiling anything that's wrong. And it has these lovely messages where it's like, oh, you've passed me like a Boolean, and I think you meant to pass me a string. I reckon the problem came from this line, and I think this is what you need to do to fix it. And often it will actually include like the fix in the compiler. It will tell you what you need to do to fix the problem. It's really, really, really nice. So if you're having like JavaScript fatigue, there was a really good post on Medium recently where a guy was saying what it's like to learn JavaScript in the in 2016, uh, where he was talking about this like hellish, just endless list of new things you have to learn. Uh, if that's all kind of driving you mad, then yeah, I'd really recommend checking out some other things. And for me, Elm is the one to look at. I would really recommend that. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. Any other questions? Is there any way to install or change the authentication on the Res API? So yeah, the, none of the types of authentication actually come by default. They're all separate plugins. Um, yeah, so there's an authentication page on the V2 WP API thing. Uh, so if you want basic authentication, you add that plugin. And similarly, like if you want your own authentication, you can write your own additional plugin. It's got a really nice, like the authentication hooks are quite nice. So you can just basically add your own functionality. So, uh, but there are plugins for OAuth1, OAuth2. Uh, I think cookie authentication might work by default. That might not be a plugin. Okay. I'm not actually 100% sure. Yeah, but okay. the others are plugins. Any of newer stuff like JSON web tokens? Yes, yes. So I actually saw uh, someone talking about this. Um, I think there's actually, there is already a plugin that someone has made <laughs> that uses JSON web tokens. So uh, yeah, so that already exists. Uh, but it's not officially done by the REST API team. But yeah? So um, at my company, we're maintaining a fork of the uh, REST API plugin. Uh, right. And uh, it's been about a year since we've had that project at the forefront of what we're doing. So it's like on the back burner right now. But December 6th, we're trying to switch over to the core um, API, so uh, we have to bring that back to the front and update all of our custom stuff. Could you just mention briefly how do you uh, add or modify endpoints? Like, right. over, over, overview, not technical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so, um, so there's, there's a couple of ways. So if you want to just like, you're probably talking about the the more advanced way. I'll start with the easier way, but uh, there's a couple of uh, methods uh, that are just available, um, like global methods. There's, like, there's one called uh, register rest field and one called something like register rest endpoint. So to modify, you can use register rest field. It takes something like three arguments. So you, sorry? You, uh, you it, like create a plugin, an extra plugin to modify the... Yeah, I mean, you can just literally create like a function, which will just like take, so it'll take like where the REST API is at at that moment, and then you modify it how you want to modify it. So you can like add an extra field onto it just for like a PHP array so thing. it's like a secondary plugin or a, maybe part of your theme. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd probably yeah. recommend doing it as, as a mini, a tiny little plugin, yeah. a little drop-in. But yeah, or it could be part of your theme. Uh, and that's the same for the endpoints. So you can just add an endpoint, you do, and they, they just basically hook in. They're just like standard. You do like add action. There is also like a more complicated, uh, you can actually instantiate your own version of the server object. So there's a thing called, I think, WP REST server, I think. Uh, it's in, I'd really recommend actually that talk, uh, yeah, REST API, Joe Hoyle, WordCamp Europe. If you watch his talk, he'll cover that in much more detail. But yeah, there's uh, WP REST server, and from there you can just like build your whole API again. So you can like, you get all of the same methods they use to start with, and then you can say what the namespace is going to be, you can say what version it is, and you add all your own stuff. Like what WooCommerce is doing? Yes. Okay. WooCommerce is exactly that. If you want to see that in the wild, yeah, go onto the WooCommerce one. Uh, and you can just, if you just go into GitHub and like, like search their code base for like WP underscore REST, you'll find like a whole bunch of where they've used it. Um, I think we just had like a couple of custom meta stuff and like uh, some multilingual hacks for one of our sites. I don't, I don't remember, but. Yeah, you should be fine, because I, I yeah, at various points, I've kind of like made my things against the REST API, then not updated it, so I've kind of had a similar problem to you. And generally speaking, it doesn't take much to bring it back into sync. Like You're just like, oh, okay. I mean, I, I modified the endpoints for version one, and that, that, that was quite a different setup, but it took me like an hour to work out how to just transpose those and bring them to version two. So it hopefully won't be too bad. And if you forked like a year ago, very little of the fundamental way it works, I think, has changed that much. There's some like naming stuff has changed, but... Uh, like, and like back in version one, like ID was capitalized. So it's really like, so just in the field, it had ID in capital letters. And believe it or not, that like broke everything of my website because it presumed ID 
uh, it presumed it was capitalized, and then when they, when they made it lowercase, like everything just went wrong. But, uh, and I got undefined is not a function. Um, but yeah, you, you can, there's little things like that, but otherwise it's quite, quite easy. So. If you have short codes within your post and you want to pull out using the REST API, how would that be rendered out? So because the default state of the content is rendered, they are, they are automatically rendered. So what, what you get back from the REST API for content is, is HTML. So it will actually already process those short codes automatically. Uh, so that's a really nice thing, actually. A lot of, I mean, obviously, if you're building something like a theme, a lot of plugins might break. Something like Yoast SEO, that relies on page loads. So if you're changing pages without actually changing, like without doing a page load, Yoast doesn't know that you've changed pages. So it doesn't change all the meta keys and stuff. Um, but uh, but what don't, like anything that like filters the content as well will work. So I was quite delighted to discover just by chance that like the Jetpack uh, comment and liking system that all automatically works because it, it just adds it after the content in the content. So it comes out fully rendered and it just works like the little like buttons at the bottom and the social sharing and everything. That all just works even if you're doing REST API stuff. Uh, um, part of the, of the REST API was because to make sure all the filters worked. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's um, and I, so that's the other thing. I mean, I imagine, Yo I mean, Yoast SEO is actually they're, they're working on Im improving their support for REST API stuff. So I think they're going to add endpoints so that you can update the meta keys and stuff when your the meta fields when your pages change and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Is that yeah? yeah. yeah cool. So in this case, the render is basically uh, what goes to, uh, what is after going through all the filters. So will there be any point where you provide a raw field to provide the actual value in case, let's say, we want to play with it before the filters? So let's say in title we've rendered, in content we've rendered, will there in the future be a field called raw where we can actually get a raw? Yeah, like a play version. Um, yeah, I'm actually... I thought that was going to happen before, I mean, John might know more than I do. I thought that was possibly going to happen before this, what's happening now. You can add it yourself really easily. Uh, you can modify that endpoint right now. And I think there are even some plugins floating around that do exactly that, that will do like a raw or played version of the content. But yeah, so um, I, don't, I don't know if that's going to be added. I, I imagine it might. Um, I suppose the main thing... There is a discussion, but I'm not sure whether it's added yet. Yeah, maybe it's, there's definitely like a pull request for it. So I think the main thing is trying to make the REST API as like minimal as it needs to be for everyone. Uh, and then possibly uh, there might be like optional things that you can just activate that would, that would allow other things to work with it. Because I, I wanted them to put post class in. Because I was like, well, anyone who's doing anything front end with a post probably wants the post class. Um, but they were like, well, that's not very resty, and you can just easily add it yourself. So I was like, okay, fine. So for, uh, you see that the API say you can indicate a page number. So let's say uh, uh, slash post slash one. So the page number will be like question mark page equals to one, something like that. Sorry, so, okay. uh, so uh, let's say I'm getting on post, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's say uh, slash post. So how will I indicate, let's say, the page number or the number of posts that I want? In the, ah, yeah. So there's, there are other arguments that you can add to the end of an endpoint. So there's, uh, you can actually do anything that WP Query does with what are known as these little filter arguments. So you'd do like question mark filter, and then you can say uh, open square bracket, like you could say posts per page, close square bracket equals, and then you can say how many pages, posts you want per page. And you can also paginate in that way. So you can then say like which page number, not to do with like WordPress pages, but if you want to say page two, post per page 20, so you're going to get pages, uh, posts 21 to 40, like you can do all that kind of so thing. So for me, in the future, I can buy a query string, specify whether I want rendered or raw for my... Yes, yeah, you could do exactly that, because you're then now able you to... Use Sorry? For now, you're going to use a custom format function. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could also use that, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's loads of ways you can extend the endpoints. And you can actually, one thing that I came across quite early on, which anyone who's building a theme that might struggle with, is you don't normally know the post ID of a post until you get the post. So when you're building a theme, like how do you get a post by ID when you don't know what the ID is? Um, like if someone's coming to your, web, like if, if they come from a search engine to a specific post, unless you put post IDs in your URL, you don't know what it is. But the really nice thing is you can also filter by post slug, which is basically finding a post by its name. So um, this is something I did quite early on, is I took, so like the way my theme, the way Picard works, is when you go to a post, it will take 
the, like wherever the post name is in your, in your uh, URL structure, which you can get because that's, that's an option in WordPress, so you can get the option and work out where the post slug is. You then use that slug to get it from the REST API, and then you get, you get the post back. So you can get posts by their name. You don't have to use the ID, uh, which is quite, if you, anyone tries to do this, you'll find quite early on, like, oh, I don't know the ID. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one way around that. Um, all good? Thank you very much. <laughs> was I too fast? I'm really, I am really sorry. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, if you want to come and work at Automatic, we're doing lots of fun stuff with this. So automatic.com slash work with us. And if you want to ask me any more questions, I'm at Jack Lennox, like almost everywhere on GitHub and Twitter and Facebook and everything else. So yeah, thank you.